talk is the first in a series of data bites this fall that highlights issues facing current and future workers. And tonight, we're really kicking it off by having Sarah Kessler, um, an editor at Quartz who just released her book, Gig, The End of the Job and the Future of Work, talk about uh, why she wrote this book and engage in a discussion with us about what this book means and what, what this means for the future of work. Previously, Sarah covered the gig economy as a senior writer at Fast Company and managed startup coverage at Mashable. Her reporting has been cited by the Washington Post, New York Magazine, and NPR. Please help me in welcoming Sarah. And we are going to be also joined by Alex Rosenblatt, um, who is a technology ethnographer trained in sociology. Alex is the author of the upcoming Uberland, How Algorithms Are Rewriting the Rules of Work, forthcoming with the University of California Press in 2018. Her multidisciplinary scholarship spans across Uber's drivers, algorithmic management, information and power asymmetries on employment platforms, and surveillance and accountability. And you can learn more about Alex on the Data and Society website. So can we have the two of you join me over here for a little discussion? And uh, Sarah will start off by reading an excerpt from her book. Hi. So um, the excerpt that I'm going to read um, is from a story that I follow in my book about a nonprofit uh, that goes into a rural town in Arkansas, and their idea is that they can use the gig economy um, to help people find jobs. You know, maybe there's not an opportunity there, but um, they can log onto this platform and they'll find jobs. Uh, and so it's about one of the students. Uh, all right. Gary lived in a neat trailer nestled so close to the railroad tracks that it literally shook when a train passed. The door... Uh, <coughs> The door was open, and the doorbell was broken. Hello, I yelled into the screen. Come in, I heard from somewhere inside. I found Gary in a small square room filled with Tweety Bird stuffed animals, his wife's favorite. He was sitting at a table behind two laptop computers lined up side by side. We shook hands as he pulled on a headset. It was only after we heard a high-pitched ding that I understood why he hadn't answered the door. Hello, and thank you for calling Sears Home Warranty, he said in a calm, confident voice. My name is Gary. How can I help you? He then dove into a conversation about a broken air conditioner with a man who lived in New York City, pulling up reference materials and customer service scripts on his computers as he spoke. Until recently, Gary had worked at a local dog food plant, but he'd been laid off when the plant was sold to a new company. He'd heard about Terrence's class when he was at the Workforce Center, applying for jobs. For a few months after his losing his job at the plant, Gary had worked the night shift at a Tyson plant about an hour away from his home. But he hated the long nighttime commute, which scared him. You break down in the road out here, Gary told me, and you're stuck until someone comes to get you. Down here, he reiterated, there ain't no jumping on the bus. A gig, the gig economy seemed like a better option. Gary didn't get any jobs through Upwork, the original plan of the class, but Terrence had found him a placement in a huge customer service company called Arise. Nine of Terrence's students qualified for similar jobs, but only three, Gary included, had internet access fast enough to meet the company's specifications. Gary wouldn't be directly employed by Arise. Uh, he wouldn't be directly employed at all. Arise hires subcontractors that called independent business operators, IBOs, who in turn hire the people who actually answer phones. Terrence had found uh, one of these small businesses that was looking for new independent contractors. On the website of Gary's new employer, under a slideshow of a white woman in headsets with too, under a slideshow of white women in headsets with too much makeup and Photoshop white teeth, an application page explained why this employer was superior to other li others like it. We offer above minimum wage with pay increases, one bullet point said, when others offer pay by the minute. Offering more than minimum wage, it seemed, had become something to brag about. After all, the law does not require companies to ensure that independent contractors make more than a minimum wage. Imagine a nesting doll with Gary at the center. Gary was the smallest doll, an independent contractor working for the IBO, the company with the bullet points and smiley slideshow. 
Go one layer bigger and you'd see the IBO, the small business that hired Gary. Another layer bigger and you'd see Arise, the big customer service company that had made a contract with the IBO. Only after another layer would you find Sears, the company that the customer thought he was dealing with all along. Arise, no surprise, presented this startup as innovation. Under the heading, Leveraging the Power of Crowdsourcing, the company's about page at the time explained to potential customers that Arise takes advantage of innovative breakthroughs in technology and our own award-winning proprietary and patented technologies, and provides entrepreneurial entrepreneurial opportunities to many underserved populations where small business owners have the ability to create flexible schedules based on their lifestyle needs. Silicon Valley hadn't been exactly original in the way it had pitched its services as world-changing innovation. Companies like Arise were the predecessors to the gig economy. Thanks to Terrence's negotiations, Gary did not have to pay for his training, which in some in his position did. But he also did not get paid for the three week long, four hour per day program. And during that time, he had trouble paying his bills. I had or he had discon disconnection notices everywhere. In July, he'd received an official offer for not quite employment that seemed to contradict itself. This is at will employment, and you are being paid as a contractor, it said. You will be responsible for any and all applicable taxes. Appended, a hiccup of seemingly self-contradicting good cheer. Welcome to the company. His pay would start at $9 an hour, $1.50 above Arkansas's minimum wage at the time. Gary, a father of eight and a grandfather of 11, was good at customer service. Uh, workers like him were measured on three standard industry metrics. Schedule adherence, whether they worked the amount of time they had agreed to work, average hold time, and quality. He told me he usually scored in the top 5% on all three. My voice is pretty straightforward, he explained. One time, he took a call from someone who was so angry that he threatened to place a claim for every outlet, every light, and every ceiling fan in his house, as well as for 10 toilets. Gary let him vent. Finally, the man admitted, you know, I don't have 10 toilets. I'm pulling up the claims, but I'm not putting them in, Gary told him. I was waiting for you to calm down. After he completed his training and started to work, Gary's life appeared to be on the upswing. With his new paycheck and his new flexibility, he was planning a trip to Hawaii to celebrate his 15th anniversary with his wife. They'd never been on a honeymoon. He was smiling already at the <clears throat> thought of his beach vacation. Gary was trying hard at his non-job, and it was working for him, at least for the time being. There we go. Thank you so much for reading that excerpt, Sarah. Um, I think it, it, it gives us space to have a, a ton of, of different discussions about, you know, whether this is like a permanent job, whether you are a worker, or not, a, not a worker. But I wanna really start off by asking you to talk about um, how you came to write this book, because I read your work like years ago. And I, I distinctly remember this one article you wrote for Quartz where you summed it up and said, oh, this is how workers are gonna be managed in the future. This is a new management system. And it was the first time that I had actually been able to grasp really what what Uber and what other kind of gig pl uh, labor platforms were about. So how did you start from doing, uh, you know, your journalistic, uh, your, your, your journalistic work to, to the point where like, I have to write a book about this? Um, so I entered this um, largely through kind of the story that Silicon Valley was telling. Um, I was a startup reporter in 2011, which is when um, Uber and companies that were trying to copy Uber were really kind of kicking off. And so I was hearing over and over this kind of pitch, which was um, like, so unemployment is still high after the recession, but don't worry, we fixed it. Uh, we have these apps that you can press a button and you can get a job, so uh, no one will be unemployed in the future, and this is gonna unchain us from like the doldrums of the nine to five and be this wonderful entrepreneurial activity. Um, which I kind of bought for a little while, actually. 
Um, and then uh, it became like very clear that this was not necessarily the whole story when I tried to make the minimum wage myself um, for a magazine article at Fast Company. Um, and I signed up for all the platforms that had pitched this and you know, even with kind of my position of extreme advantage and um, a college degree, like it was just not happening. So I knew this wasn't the full story. Um, and so I became much more interested in kind of what this meant for people who are working this way. And at some point also like uh, a narrative emerged where on the one hand there was still the like, this is the best thing that ever happened, we're all gonna be entrepreneurs. And then on the other hand there was like, um, this is terrible and exploitative for everybody and you know, we're all gonna be working in sweatshops next month, so get ready. Um, and like the truth was not exactly you know, somewhere in between there is different for different people. Uh, so in the book, I followed people who are in really different situations working in the gig economy and talk about kind of how it looks from their perspective. That's, that's exactly what I loved about the book was you actually walk through the stories of many people on more than, more than just Uber on multiple different labor platforms. So did you, and, I, and this is a question for both you and for Alex. Alex is an ethnographer, so her perspective on this is pretty different as well. But did you, how do you, how do you, how do, who, who does the gig platform work for? You know, who does it work for and how do they sort of see it and how do they conceptualize gig work? Um, so I think that uh, what's difficult about that question is that it works differently for different people. Um, and I'd say like most things, it tends to work better for you if you have a lot of money and can buy your own kind of savings account where you don't need to know exactly how much money you're gonna make next week because you probably still have enough money to buy groceries if it's off. Um, so, uh, in the book, I followed kind of people who it was working for and people who it wasn't. Um, I also think kind of it's not perfect in any case. And so whenever you have this discussion, you have to kind of balance that for a lot of people, it is an opportunity. And it is kind of like the work that's available for what they need to do. And in that sense, it's like a valuable thing to them. Um, but it also can be true that it's not necessarily fair how it works. Um, which is a kind of a nuance that is hard to convey sometimes um, in popular media. So I've been running around more than 25 cities in the US and Canada talking to drivers for the last four years or so. And I spend a lot of time in online forums where they gather, there was probably upwards of 300,000 drivers who gather in the forums that I follow, but there's many more beyond that. And the question that you ask, I have, it's, it's true that it's complicated. For some people, you know, it's a lifesaver. Their business has gone under and they need to make ends meet and they've got bills to pay. And they can be signed up and working and driving, you know, within like four days. That's remarkable. At the same time, I think there's a lot of truth to what you just said, Sarah. Like, it's not necessarily, the conditions under which they're working aren't necessarily fair, even if the, this does present an economic opportunity. And so there's this sort of balance between an app that can create opportunities, but an app that also limits your prospects. And that limitation is pretty interesting because Uber and other companies like it build itself as creating entrepreneurship for the masses. Like, and this was just after the Great Recession, you know, this was a very enticing call. Um, and what I found in my research is that drivers are actually managed by algorithms that limit their prospects in a lot of ways and manage them to standardize their behavior in the services they provide in all of these different places. And so it's, it's really interesting, because like you can go to work and you can make money, and that's great. And at the same time, Uber sets the rates, changes them at will, experiments with pricing policies. And if you don't like it, you don't have to log in. But you might have taken out a lease on a new car and invested in this job. And so you might still have to go to work under conditions that are hard to describe as fully free and independent, which was sort of a lot of the marketing um, behind the company. What I found is that the people who are happiest are often like the hobbyists. There's recreational drivers who do it for the social connection. You know, you might have a driver who works with patients as a psychotherapist, and the, the patients have PTSD, and they have a lot of anxiety. And 
you might want to go to work because you're having pretty superficial conversations with your passengers, and that's a relief. You know, that person's like probably not the best metric by which to evaluate whether the gig economy is following through on its promises. But at the same time, there's a variety of people who do this work, and they have different motivations. I'd say that for drivers who made big investments who try and work full time, they're often at getting the short end of the stick because the conditions under which they work change so rapidly. You know, they start off with one car in a new market, and there's not a lot of drivers, the rates are high. And then after a company like Uber becomes legitimate, you know, after some struggles with regulators, Uber will cut the rates and flood the market with drivers with all sorts of vehicles. And you're like, well, I still gotta support my family. So I'd say there's a pretty big range. Yeah, and um, to that point, kind of talking about the Uber example, I think another thing that's important is when you say gig economy, people mean different things. And some people mean kind of all freelancers. And there are a lot of very like happy, wealthy freelancers who are lawyers and doctors and um, psychotherapists. And they do have this story about it being like uh, this free experience of entrepreneurship. Um, and I think a lot of what happened is like companies like Uber adopted those stories as though they would be true for also the people on their platform and also the people who were you know, making much less money. Yeah, that's, I mean, I totally agree with both of you. As someone who comes out of this from a labor perspective and someone who looks at sort of models of employment, I, I feel like the U.S. has been sold into this idea that small businesses are good things, but the rates of small business failures are ridiculously high. So it, I, I, from the very beginning, kind of question why, you know, this idea of like starting your own small business, particularly when there's so little economic policy that supports your being success as a small business, is a, is a good idea. I mean, it, it's all premised on that day in my, in my mind. But... But so that, that's just my opinion. But I, I, you think you brought up another thing, because in your story, you also talk about some people who don't see it as necessarily um, a small business, but like a way to make money really quickly or a way to, um, to start a, a new career path. Um, so can you talk about like what was it that let that allowed them to be successful? Like why why what was in place that allowed them to be successful on the platforms? Um, I actually think in some ways this is a better question for you. Who's been driving around with Uber drivers for years? <laughs> <laughs> Could you repeat the question so I've got exactly what to answer? So what made people successful on the platform that they were living on? Yeah, what were <laughs> I'm not sure success is the right criteria. Um, I mean, if you're doing it for a couple of months because you need to pay the bills, you need to supplement your income, like you're probably going to do relatively well. But at the same time, there's a major information asymmetry. So it's really easy to get hired, um, to start working right away. It takes a couple of months to figure out what your expenses are. And I remember one year during my field work, a uh, tax season hit, and there were all these drivers in forums going like, wait a minute, taxes? Like they hadn't thought about being independent contractors and what that would mean, and they hadn't put aside money to pay taxes, and they thought that their take home pay was what they were getting. Um, and they weren't necessarily accounting for all of their expenses. And there's this interesting dynamic where if you're doing this in a supplementary way, like 15 hours a week, is it worth your while to go home and like log all your expenses and spend the hours like updating your Excel spreadsheet? Uh, and if you're a full-time driver, you know you do that, but it takes a, it takes some time to learn what exactly you should you should be tracking. And so it might seem successful, you might be happy with it, and it might get you, you might pay the bill or the bills that you have, but it change like how you're affected by this model changes over time. Okay, um, I deferred to Alex on that one because um, if you're interested in like the mechanics of how this actually works, like nobody knows more about this than her, and her book um, does a great job of explaining that. And you should all get that book too. It's called Uberland. <laughs> I read it; it was amazing. Um, but kind of on the broader kind of um, scale, like in my book, I followed. Um, a woman who worked for Amazon Mechanical Turk, 
Um, how many of you know what Amazon Mechanical Turk is? Okay, thanks for not raising your hand, some people. Um, it's okay. <laughs> so Amazon Mechanical Turk is a platform that Amazon created basically to fill gaps in what technology can actually accomplish, but it like wants to do automatically. So um, for instance, for a while it had, uh, you know, like it's, in order to like teach kind of its webs its uh, its website how to categorize like oh here are the blue dresses and here are the red dresses and here are the yellow dresses, it would like send all those photos to this platform where thousands of workers were gathering and for two cents they could say that's a red dress, um, things like that or uh, what's another one. Like one time an entrepreneur pitched me like this you know, really magical app where you could take a picture of any food and it would return, it would identify the food automatically using its proprietary algorithm and then it would tell you how many calories was in it. Um, so you log into Mechanical Turk and sure enough there's a task there that people can get paid three cents to label this food for the, for the entrepreneur who has the magic technology. So this is the platform you make often cents at a time per task. Uh, this woman in my book, uh, her husband lost his job during the recession at a factory. Uh, she thinks, okay, I have to make a lot of money. I haven't really worked outside of the home. I've applied to McDonald's. They haven't hired me. Um, but I know I can make money if I just log on to Mechanical Turk right now. And so she did. She made $40,000 a year, about like five cents at a time. Um, which is really incredible, and the way she did it is that she's a genius. Like the <laughs> things that this, like, the system she set up, and the um, like the she like wrote little computer programmer programs. So like instead of type you know clicking like yes that's a red dress submit, she could just hit the R key, and it would do all those things for her. So she could do those super fast. Um, she set up an alarm system on this forum where people would share like, oh, a good task just went up, um, like a high paying task just went up. So whenever somebody did that, it would like automatically check and see if she was allowed to do it. And if she was, it would set off an alarm and she would like go running anywhere she was in her house to like go do this task. Um, so she had all these kind of like hacks to make it work. And oh, one of my favorite is uh, Amazon had this service where you took pictures of products in stores. And the idea was like they would send you the price on Amazon. So you would see it was cheaper on Amazon. She would send them affiliate links. So she would get a kickback every time they bought a product because she'd signed up as a salesperson for Amazon. I don't know. She had like all these really clever things. So she made $40,000 a year. And you're like, OK, that's great. Um, it's probably, it's like, like she made it work. Um, but at the same time, she had like terrible carpal tunnel and like needed surgery and didn't have any sick days. Um, she like would come across slideshows where without any labeling or anything, it would be like label these ISIS execution photos, um, like people forgetting that they're dealing with human workers. Um, and so there's just like this, you know, you're like, we can't really feel so good about this being there, even if it was important that it was there. Um, yeah, I, I remember reading that in sort of the petition that they had about the, the studies on um, Turkopticon. Uh, for guys, you'll have to read the book to figure out what that's about um, and buy the book. But I think like that story brought up two big things for me. One is sort of the amount of like unpaid work that so many people have to do on these platforms and sort of not thinking about the ways that workers can be harmed, right? By seemingly, this is their own choice. So you can't, you have to be responsible for your own decisions. But what happens when you, you get, you get a, a, a video and you have no clue what it's labeled and what does that do to you psychologically in a lot of ways? I know Alex has started to do some work in sort of like unpaid labor. So I don't know if you wanna add a little bit on that. Mechanical Turk is an incredibly popular platform for researchers. Mm -hmm. They will delegate tasks. It's an easy population to fill out surveys and stuff like that. The population tends to be divided between like the US and India. Um, and Mary Gray does a lot of really interesting work around this. Uh, but I am always perplexed as to why it's like ethically acceptable to just sort of use Mechanical Turkers to see images that might be really traumatizing. So 
if you were to invite a subject to do your study, you might sort of give them warnings about what they were getting into. And mechanical truckers are kind of treated as like remote objects who can complete a task just like it's described. And the fact that they end up getting the sort of short end of the stick on that really gives me a lot of pause. I'm glad you don't do that. They didn't say it's very strong ethical review, by the way, as I'm learning. Um, well, I wanted to delve into another part that you also um, start to you, you tease out in your book, which is about um, uh, the different strategies that platforms employ. So you talk about one company that um, has a good job strategy. And I'm really interested in that because I'm really interested in thinking about how do we, how do you, how do you make sure that um, that, or how do you create incentives for companies to do the right thing? Like, is it possible for them to balance the interests of venture capital money um, with the interests of workers and, and clients, which may be different from the interests of venture capital? Or is that not possible because the only model that's out there is the Uber model or the, the independent contractor model? Yeah, so... Um at the height of kind of the Uber for X, you remember like there was like Uber for laundry and Uber for washing your car and Uber for delivering gas to your car. Okay. Um, like investors were really looking at it as kind of uh, a way that um, service work could scale as though it were software. So like without any further investment, you could have an on the ground service that could like take over the whole country in a month. Um, and you wouldn't have to like open offices or manage people or hire people. You would just um, kind of have this crowd full of, uh, you know, independent people who would be there if you had a job for them and wouldn't be there if you didn't. Um, and I think kind of throughout the next few years, a lot of those companies found out that that's not really, that like wouldn't actually work for them. Like Uber, bring a person from A to B place, um, there's not a ton of variation in how you can do that beyond like don't crash the car and like don't speed, um, but like clean someone's house. It matters a lot that you like take your shoes off before you enter and you know know what to do with their knickknacks or whatever the job entails. And so a lot of them ran into this problem where their service wasn't very good, and the or it was very variable. Um, you know, people like really loved how Anna did the job, but they really, you know, Mark didn't do a good job and they'd complain about it. Um, and the way that, you know, most companies would uh, create a consistent service is through training and standards, um, which if these companies were to try to implement, which they did in kind of roundabout ways, they risk like, oh, well, you actually have employees then because you're telling them exactly how to do your job, do their jobs. So they kind of got in this, they had this choice of, you know, we can continue to try to like skirt like, oh, well, we're not telling them, you know, to, to wash the dishes. We're telling them that uh, workers who get five stars always wash the dishes. And if they don't get five stars, they have to leave the platform. Um, or hire the workers, but that kind of destroys the reason that like venture capitalists were interested in the first place. Um, so this one company that I followed in the book uh, called Managed by Q, they started off by hiring contractors to do the work, which was cleaning offices. Um, but had kind of these service problems where they couldn't control the quality um, and instead decided that they would try to use a strategy of um, hiring people, paying them more than average uh, for the work that they were doing and like paying full health insurance, um, providing kind of career path. Uh, and they got this, or at least articulated this theory through the work of a researcher at MIT uh, whose name is Zainab Tun. Um, and she studies companies like uh, Costco and Trader Joe's um, who have uh, figured out how to profit by paying people more and treating them better, uh, which in her theory is not an automatic thing that happens, pay people more and you'll make more money, but a thing that if you take advantage of the benefits that you get when you pay people more, like they might stay at your company for a longer time and be better salespeople because they know the products um, that you can make more money that way. That's like a choice that you can make to make more money. Um, the thing about it 
is, so they were able to do that. I think in the book, they went from like 30 people that they employed to more than a thousand while I was um, talking to them. And so they kind of proved that you could slowly build this business, it would work, they became profitable. Um, but at the same time, I think one thing that was kind of disheartening is the reason that venture capitalists were interested in them was not for this slow burning, like, you know, you're gonna provide a lot of good jobs, totally sustainable business. Uh, the reason venture capitalists were interested in them is because of their potential for growth, which they have because they install a platform, like an iPad, um, in every office that they clean that lets people buy other services. Like, oh, I need like paper towels, so I'm gonna buy it through this platform. Like, I need a caterer, I'm gonna buy it through this platform. So it was that part that really interested the venture capitalists. Um, and so I don't know that anyone in Silicon Valley is really interested in funding kind of that slow growth, sustainable uh, model. Do you have anything else? No, I have a question for you yeah. though. Um, from reading Gigged, which you should all buy if you haven't already, because it's excellent. <laughs> um, I started thinking about the different perspective you were seeing as a journalist, mm -hmm. because you were receiving all of these pitches from all of these companies that were saying, like, we're the Uber for X. And also, I imagine, like, well, not imagine, you, you also spoke with VCs and were sort of getting, like, what is their interest in funding these companies? And I wonder how much you think that pushed the narrative of the gig economy being like the next frontier for defining the way that work would be in the future. Yeah, that definitely was a, a big, like the Silicon Valley push, I think, and the creation of the term gig economy kind of did um, put it on people's radars. Um, I'm trying to think of what the question, what was the question? Well, how much do you think that the, the sort of idea that the gig economy was going to be defining how mm -hmm. we all work and live and play was coming from the sort of yeah. Silicon Valley push to mm -hmm. redefine work as something that was itemizable and like reduced human labor. Yeah, a good deal of it. And also I think uh, it's hard to remember now, but for a while kind of Silicon Valley would do something and it had a halo effect. Like we all thought like, oh, well, if like, if a technology startup is doing it, it must be good for the world. I know this is a long time ago now, <laughs> but it happened. And so there was this thing that they did where they all tried to define themselves a bigger purpose than just like, well, we'd rather not pay for health insurance. Like, you know, it had to be like a world changing thing. And so that's what they came up with is we're ending unemployment. Um, um. Well, my, my last um, observation was, and I think Alex, you and I have talked about this a little bit, but for, for me, one of the big things that I was looking for is like, well, what agency do workers have in this? Are workers just controlled willy-nilly, sent here, sent there? You're gonna get a zero rating because you forgot to take off your shoes and you're gonna get kicked off the platform because a passenger wanted to smoke in your car and you said no, or the next passenger gave you a bad, bad rating because someone did smoke in your car. You're kind of trapped in this space. For like, especially in talking with Alex, I sort of saw that workers were negotiating with the algorithms or bargaining with them. Um, and, and, you know, in traditional worker organizing, bargaining is basically bargaining, negotiating with your manager to get the conditions to make you successful. So if you're being asked to do a task but you don't have the tools, you, have, you negotiate for the tools. If you're being asked to come in early to set up the store before you start work, you get paid for those hours. So I, I think that for, for me is a conception, but I think of bargaining and, and pushing back. But what you you actually came across some other instances, and I'd love for you to talk about like what not so much you know giving away what they did, but so much talk about like what is the motivation behind why they got to that point where they're like I have to do something. Um, I think if your manager is an app, it's really frustrating because you can't tell the app you know like my you know, my relative just died, I need to go to the funeral, and that's why I'm not coming to do the job I said I would. You know, it, it treats you, you're like, it's the mentality is very much like um, you like, figuring out how to get around a system rather than like a human relationship that you might have um, with your actual manager. 
with all sorts of exceptions. It's more like, here's the rules. I need to figure out how I can make the rules work for me. Um, and often, I don't know, you saw like a lot of companies who were establishing in the space of like Uber and you know, they had set up customer service lines long before they set up any adequate lines for people who are working on the platform to contact them. Um, and so you saw things like um, Uber drivers. Um, and I don't think this was like all Uber drivers by any means, but there were a few attempts to like try to organize a strike. Um, but then you're trying to find all these people who don't gather in the same place, who might not all speak the same language. Um, and in my book, at one point, someone's like driving around in San Francisco with a megaphone yelling at other drivers, like, no, there's a strike. Like, don't take Uber right now. I'm like, that's just not going to work. Um, so I think that there's like traditional methods don't necessarily work, and it's kind of a different mentality when you're trying to figure out how to make it work on an app. I would see Uber drivers, and as you'll read in Uberland, they would email their customer service. And customer service could be like the email equivalent of a call center located in the Philippines and explain that they weren't paid correctly. And it might take like five or six emails to get back, you know, three dollars or eleven dollars. And it could just be extremely frustrating because, in a way, if you set up a customer service that is unresponsive to anything but the most basic FAQ, you've effectively found a method to scale potentially like mass low-level wage theft because it's just too much effort to negotiate back for what you're owed. It, you might make more money if you just go do another ride. And so drivers would sort of balance between like the effort it takes to try and bargain with the algorithm that is your boss versus just sort of making the choice to continue working and trying to optimize to your own interests. I think a common thread that Sarah and I have both found is that the gig economy can work really well for optimizers, for people who can like sort of pull together $40,000 a year, five cents at a time. And it's the same for drivers. There's drivers who find ways of like knowing the rules, maximizing um, for, for profit, and that works really well. But they change. So, yeah. but the optimizers always also have to keep up with all of the different rules that change. So, one thing that I discuss in Uberland is how Uber actually brings a Silicon Valley spirit of experimentation to employment. And what we can see, because drivers' livelihoods are on the line, is all the ways this can go badly. Uh, because if you're expecting to earn a premium, you know, your algorithmic boss tells you you can earn a premium if you drive in a particular place at a particular time, and it turns out that like the surge pricing has evaporated by the time you arrive, you're like, well, wait a minute. You know, that doesn't seem very fair. But the same sorts of recommendation systems that we experience on Netflix, which might recommend like the next rom-com we might want to watch, you know, it's cool to have the recommendation, but if we don't like the rom-com, like the stakes are pretty low. You know, and so what's been really fascinating for me in, in writing Uberland is just to see how like the excitement of innovation plays out in an employment context where we have a greater sense that people's livelihoods are on the line, uh, they're supporting their families, and that things are more serious and therefore deserve more regulation, more stability. So is it, would it be that hard for any of the platforms to just make these simple changes. They seem like really simple changes that would make the lives of, of workers happier and maybe not lead to instances of drivers trying to organize, or, or maybe it wouldn't. I don't know if you have an answer to that. I think you might have a perspective on it as a long-time organizer. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Do you want to, do you want to answer your own question? <laughs> no, I actually don't. I actually yeah. I've thought about it, but I don't have an answer. I mean, yeah, they're starting to make a lot of changes where they like made a bunch of changes recently, kind of when they were deep into this PR scandal because there was so much going on that drivers had been asking for for years and years, like add a tip feature to the app. Um, that would be very easy for Uber to do, but it took them years to do it. So I don't think they're in any hurry to do this or like why can't you just know how much you will make next week? and how much you'll earn per mile or, or whatever. Like, why does it have to be this game? Um, and some of that's probably because they're always optimizing. Like, they get better results that way. Um, so I don't know 
if I have a happier answer than that. Oh, you're gonna have to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess I guess what I've been hearing from Alex and, and sort of others is they don't have any real incentive to, you know. Uh, I think that's really what it is. Um, but it just, it, it see, you know, I still am struggling with it because it seems like such a simple thing. Just tell me how much I'm gonna make at the end of this ride. Um, but maybe that's the whole point is that that's how they have power is they have all the information and 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 that's how these systems work. But um, oh, are we, oh, I guess uh, it's time. We have a, a couple minutes left for um, audience questions. But first, I want to say thank you so much um, for indulging me in this conversation. Uh, I really appreciate hearing the different perspectives and being here has really helped me to kind of open my thinking about how do we really integrate and think about technology into an analysis of like, how do you build power if you understand technology and what it's meant to do? So, all right, um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll bring the mic to you. And pl please just say your name really briefly. Or actually you don't have to, sorry, I realized that. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Nisha. And um, I really enjoy that talk. That was really great. I work at an Amazon fulfillment center, and one of the things you sort of realize really quickly is that um, they treat you like a robot because they want you to be a robot. Like they're building robots to replace you eventually. <laughs> um, how much did that kind of come into the conversation? Like with Uber, the goal is to not have drivers. Right, so they're gonna postpone treating them right until they figure out how to get their cars to stop killing people. So, like, was that like a part of like the general conversation with a lot of these companies, or you know, was that eventually we won't need workers, so we can kind of push it as far as yeah. possible? Um, in my book, I quote um, Travis Kalanick the, saying that basically, like, we're gonna have self-driving cars, so we don't have to solve like these problems with workers. Uh, so I, I think that that's true. Um, Mechanical Turk is in the same situations in a lot of ways. Like they're doing the work to teach the artificial intelligence how to do that same work. Like it's, you know, if, if the artificial intelligence gets enough examples of like this is a red dress, this is a blue dress, it'll eventually learn how to do it that themselves. And um, so that's a very weird psychology. You, I mean. Like Christy, who's in that job, um, she decided that the only safe, because she eventually went to college and got a degree, um, and she decided the only safe degree was psychology because people would always want to like talk to their about their problems with other people, and that's kind of what that experience made her feel. Yeah, I actually think it's a ploy. I think that by saying self-driving cars are coming soon, or as my kids call them, headless cars are coming soon, that you can deflect really urgent questions about providing labor protections. You know, why should you have to apply labor law or accommodate labor law if self-driving cars and other sort of autonomous technologies are quickly going to take over labor? And so in a way, I feel that it's like a really useful ploy for shifting the narrative away from human-centered concerns. Um, <laughs> I don't I don't have an answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Jacob. Uh, thanks so much. Those were fantastic talks. Um, so in the case of Uber and Lyft and the other ride sharing services, you know, they lose money on every ride and subsidize every ride. And in the case of a lot of the Uber for X companies, you know, they never made money and don't exist anymore or still are not making money and might not exist. So I guess my question is, what happens when that money dries up, right? What happens if and when they actually need to charge a market rate for their services? Uh, so I don't know. What I know is Uber has raised money, like so much money from so many different people, including like Saudi Arabia, that there's so many people with a lot of money that like have so much in, it'd be hard for them to say like, oh, it's going to fail, like we'll just let it go. Like I think the, um, 
the extent to which they'll be propped up for a long time is probably not, uh, it's not like a short time. Um, also, I think we should refer to Uber as an app for subsidizing um, yuppies transportation, because that's functionally what it does right now. Um, all right. <laughs> I think one of the really interesting conversations Uber has brought to the fore is about monopoly. And it's not just about Uber, right? It reflects backwards to lots of Silicon Valley companies that have effective monopolies on lots of public spheres. So if you look at Facebook as a primary distributor of news, like there's lots of media organizations, but Facebook is a gatekeeper. Right? And I think these conversations about like, okay, these singular companies have come in and established something that starts to resemble a monopoly, that's where you get a much more interesting coalition of actors who are like, okay, it's not just about whether a ride's gonna be profitable and whether we'll all have to pay more. Like, yes, if you're a monopoly, you can effectively charge a higher price <laughs> once you've taken over and like put all the taxi cabs out of business. But I think it's actually invigorated a lot of interesting coalitions around what does it mean to be in a society that is dominated by technology and how will that affect us as a society? And that's one of the conversations that has come out of what is effectively like a technology-based taxi cab, right? Like it's amazing that you can have a conversation about monopoly and a taxi in the same breath. And the, the companies have actually bridged so many different narratives together that they've become really interesting lenses for sort of looking at how it plays out on the ground. Um, my, I have two thoughts on that. One, I think part of what Uber is trying to do now is actually change uh, policy in order to stop subsidizing so much. So they're really trying to push that all drivers are independent contractors in state uh, legislatures across the country along with other plat labor platform companies to really change that so that it becomes them less um, having to subsidize that and pushing it more onto workers and public system. Uh, the second is there is a totally different conversation around the financial markets and venture capital, how it fits into all of this, which I can't answer, but that is the other part of the com the conversation that might be part of thinking about how is this going to continue. And it, um, and then the last part is I, you know, I think Uber has also mentioned that aside from having autonomous vehicles, they're actually really just here for the data. They really just want all the data, and that's where they're going to change their turn their attention. Um, so it's a, it's a really big question. I, I, I love that we can have this conversation, try to figure out how to knit it all together. Uh, one day, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Hopefully not too late. Hi, uh, I'm MC. Um, thank you so much for this talk. Uh, I wanted to ask about, sort of piggybacking on something that Alex just said about, um, how this is changing like broader conceptions of stuff, and especially thinking about the Supreme Court rulings in the last couple of years about labor unions, um, and wondering how the gig economy, like how people who work in the gig economy see themselves as laborers. I'm especially interested in your first example from your reading, a guy who used to be a factory worker, and now is a gig economy worker, it had to be a sort of radical change in how he saw himself as a, a laborer and how you guys think that might be affecting conversations about labor as as like a like democratic concept or, or something or, or labor unions or these these bigger structures beyond just the individuals working these jobs. <laughs> um, I guess I'll take that one. Uh, I, I mean, I, I think definitely the decisions coming out of the Supreme Court put a lot of uh, pressure on labor unions um, because they're specifically going after the structures that allow them to be effective and to organize. So I think that's going to make it even harder. I think um, what you what is less seen is, and I and I worked in retail, so the workers that a lot of workers don't actually go entirely into gig work. They have half a foot in regular jobs and half a foot in the other jobs because uh, they aren't making enough in one or the other to survive. And, it, and, it, and the same forces that sort of c 
control or, or move gig work are also the ones that are limiting the number of hours that workers have in more traditional jobs. So it's the same kind of like forces that are at work there. I think um, there has been su some successes with organizations organizing within tech and also organize with tech workers, but also you know the Google bus drivers that are also in those same campuses and the cafeteria workers and a janitorial staff. Um, so there, there's still some of that are in the same spaces. And you know, being here, I'm definitely learning that um, even though you know tech isn't considered like a tech workers aren't considered a, a workforce that have, that are likely to join, join labor unions. I think they do have similar um, beliefs about about you know, a good, good life. An interesting thing just to, to follow if you're interested in that is Seattle. Um, Seattle City passed an ordinance that um, Uber drivers and Lyft drivers could form a union, um, which then they were immediately sued by the US Chamber of Commerce. And they're still kind of working that out. But that might be like an interesting to, thing to follow and kind of see how successful they are doing that. I've been thinking a lot about how Uber blurs the line between a worker and a consumer. And this came out of a couple of conversations that I had with senior Uber employees, as well as lawsuits that Uber has been in over employment misclassification, where when faced with you know, the fact that drivers are managed by algorithms that enforce standards of behavior and effectively leverage a lot of control over how drivers behave on the job, you know, there's been, across the world, <laughs> lawsuits over whether or not they should be classified as independent contractors or whether they're better classified as employees. And during at least one of those lawsuits, Uber's lawyer said, well, they're really just consumers of our technology, just like passengers. And I was like flummoxed. I was like, <laughs> because it was reiterated to me in conversations with senior employees. They would be like, how can we improve relations with our users? And I was going like, that's amazing. <laughs> like, yes, they're, they're technology consumers, but it doesn't mitigate the fact that they're also workers. And yet, this conversation about how we are at the other end of a technology service that we're consuming is actually starting to blur the line between what a worker is and what a consumer is in ways that I explore through Uberland, but also I'm just genuinely fascinated by. <laughs> and so I'm sorry. Oh. Just at that point, I've seen um, platforms in different areas charge the people who work on them to be on the platform, which is like a form of defending themselves legally as like these are consumers, they're paying us, um, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, the, the freemium models. And I think um, just a plug for the Beyond Disruption report that Data Insider uh, released, which looks at care and cleaning. Uh, some care and cleaning workers are actually like charged a fee for, for cancellation that it's actually quite high. Um, I just wanted to say that even though Uber may blur the line between user and worker, they don't do that with user and client. They or did, it's the argument doesn't go that direction either, even though they're also users. So it makes me think that they use that argument when it benefits them. I actually think that it sort of reveals how we're all treated by obscured powers on technology platforms. I remember the shock that people felt when Facebook experimented on their emotional t states by altering their news feeds. And the shock was principally because people didn't realize that a non sort of objective neutral algorithm was curating their news feed. The absence of clear curators is a key component to highlighting how technology platforms are simply neutral arbiters of anything from our public sphere to the rides we accept or take. And so to me, how drivers experience algorithms and the ways that they rewrite the rules of work reflects backwards onto how we're all treated as consumers on these platforms. Who had their hand up? Um, hi, I'm Kathleen. Um, I really look forward to getting your books and reading them. Um, I guess I have more of a comment than a question, although there may be questions that you see in what I'm going to say. Um, I think that the attention on technology and the apps and the platforms is really right where it needs to be today. 
but that what we're really looking at, particularly with regard to like Sarah's examples, is a fundamental restructuring of the relationship between the firm and the worker, or the company and the worker, and the introduction of more and more intermediaries in the labor market between the worker and the firm. And there are a lot of forces driving that that aren't just technology. It, it can be reducing labor costs, it can be wanting to lessen their liability. And so I think that as, as we move forward, I mean, having been at these issues for longer than I, I want to even say, but you know, in the 80s, we were talking about contingent work and it was fundamentally the same issues that we're now talking about, although the technology certainly is an accelerant to more and more people having access to independent contracting. Yeah, no, I totally agree, and I spend a lot of time in my book trying to make that point. Um, but what's interesting is kind of this latest like wave of where the gig economy companies, it's almost like an extreme version of this thing that's been happening a long time, and it's also a microcosm. Uh, so one thing I think that is good about the fact that we made this new term called the gig economy is that a lot of people are talking about these long-standing problems and you know, like the solutions to them are not about changing the apps, they're about changing kind of like fundamentally how things like capital and benefits and like and labor organizing and laws are structured. Um, so like put a little bit of fuel on those discussions, which I think is a good thing, not a bad thing. I agree. Yeah. This is our last question. Hi, this is Nathan, I'm at the New School. I wanted to ask you about alternatives to the gig economy because if you think about how workers themselves can make decisions, if we create worker cooperatives, member-run companies, what could be alternatives to Uber that are co-op Ubers? And why haven't those taken off? Is it an issue of scale? Is it an issue of social mechanisms that are hard to function at that level? Uh, but would that create more transparency and accountability? And the second part of it is, what is the role of the state? the city in all of this. In, in the end, these kind of car sharing systems also create a very unsustainable culture of transportation and which the cities can't handle anymore. So at what, at what point can, has the city really got to think about reframing their own relationship to these companies? So um, I'll take the first part of that question, um, which is about worker cooperatives. And one thing that's interesting is that uh, the same technology that makes it easier to dispatch independent contractors could uh, be used to, you know, coordinate co-ops in a new way. Like traditionally, co-op structures are cumbersome because you have to vote, and that takes a long time. But if you have a push notification vote on this thing, like that's a little bit easier. Um, marketing costs and getting people to participate in your co-op as customers are really high. But we're in the age of social media and all these kind of supposedly free marketing opportunities. Um, and there are companies that have tried to make co-op version of of like gig economy companies. Um, and I guess the primary problem is like who funds them and who gets them going. But there have been successes. There's a, photo, there's a um, stock photo site called Stocksy um, that paid back dividends to all of its um, photographers. And the reason that it worked is because it gives a better rate to them. It was actually uh, founded by people who were executives at iStock Photo who were like, we can do this better. And the reason it works is because they pay more, and so the best photographers come there, and so people want to go use those photos. Um, so co-ops, I think, are an interesting alternative. Um, who wants to take the cities? Do you want to have I can take part of it. <laughs> I'm not sure it's clear that it's unsustainable for cities to have services like Uber and Lyft, but I do know it's been difficult for them to get access to the data on what is effectively like a new line of transit. And that's really tough if you're trying to plan for traffic management. Um, and so I think it'd be useful for cities and other stakeholders to explore how they can get the data in other ways, or even as these services are coming to their cities to insert that as part of the sort of concessions that they negotiate around. I mean, a real problem for cities as Uber and Lyft like showed up was that they didn't necessarily know what they wanted from these companies. Like, they wanted cooperation of some kind, but knowing specifically what kind of data you might need on a service that has just arrived but actually has the power to become infrastructural is difficult to anticipate. Um, so I think it might be useful for them to have independent sources of data through which they can offer evaluations of their impact on cities. Um, and the role of, 
<laughs> government generally or regulators generally has often been in addressing the legal concerns around whether or not like the employment practices are a violation of labor law or something like that. The, like Uber's had so many lawsuits, I think someone developed a tracker at some point. Um, but that just goes to show that like they are offering like this really popular service that expands so rapidly that you end up sort of debating the details in like four years later in front of the Federal Trade Commission. <laughs> it's so disconnected from like the contempt, like the daily struggle of anything. Uh, and this is a bit of a tangent, but just like a couple of weeks ago, drivers started receiving checks from the Federal Trade Commission because Uber had entered into a $20 million settlement um, over the fact that it misled drivers about their potential earnings. Um, but I think they brought that to the FTC's attention in like 2014 or 2015. And so when drivers got the checks, they were posting in forums going, I don't remember signing up for this class action lawsuit. Do you? Do you? You know, like there's no connection in between like remedies that are brought forward through mechanisms of regulators and the state and how drivers are experiencing uh, fair or unfair treatments on the platforms. And so I think there's a lot of work to be done there to even just connect <laughs> sort of the, the legal resolutions to like fairness in, in, at work. I think my take on it is a little bit different. Um, I don't see Uber as any different from taxis, and I don't see Airbnb as any different from a hotel. And I think cities are tasked with trying to create a good infrastructure for these programs, but they get this, there's this tendency to say Uber and Lyft are different from taxis. They provide the same services, and actually taxis have apps now that do pretty much the same thing. The taxis are highly regulated by the city, and Uber is sort of operated outside of the rules that are existing, even though they say they're a tech company, but the actuality of their work is still physical, in physical spaces in cities. And so I think what cities need to do is reevaluate how they're seeing the work being performed and focus on the drivers broadly, as opposed to saying Uber is somehow different from from taxis and regulating them similarly, because otherwise it creates like a, a two-tiered system within that work environment. The same applies for Airbnb, which claims that they're not a hotel, but 70% of the people who use Airbnb run own multiple uh, apartments. They're, they're running dis, a disaggregated hotel. So it's really interesting that tech has this allure of being like here in the sky and it's, everything's in the cloud, but it, it actually isn't on the ground. Um, I think cities are gonna have to deal with this more and more, particularly as we deal with smart cities, adoption of IoT, and then from what I understand, most cities, uh, cybersecurity is horrible. <laughs> like cities are, are, are taken for ransom all the time. So I think the state has a huge role to play in, in kind of um, reevaluating and reapplying the rules that exist. But also I think what this highlights is that the rules have changed and they have to think about what new rules can be integrated into the infrastructure that's already there. And with that, I'm going to turn it. Uh, with that, <laughs> that ends um, our data bite. Uh, thank you, everyone, for participating. I want to say, yes, round of applause for.